Hey everybody, this is Carlos Azalar, founder and CEO of G2 Esports, former professional gamer and wonderful bodybuilder, as you may have known. Of course, you know me for that, pretty sure. And you're watching Dan Ken's channel, Thorin, my man. Enjoy. Right, this is going to be episode number... I can't even remember what I just said. Is it, did I say five? I think five. I it, think was five. it was six. Six, it was... right. Episode six. Yeah, you could be right on that one, right? Episode six of Elitists United. And you know what, veteran? Celebrate. I know it doesn't seem like there's much to celebrate, but this is a celebration day because here's the problem. I had a dilemma the whole split long that I couldn't talk about on the episode, which is, on the one hand, listen... I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hide my own biases. I was fucking loving that fanatic was fucking shit in the bed and they lose all his games. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I'll, I'll tell you straight to your face. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows it, right? I was loving it. And not 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 even just because, like, you know, some of the players in the team I think are a bit overrated, but also because, you know, there's also just that like the troublemaker aspect where it's kind of fun to see like a top team fall for a while and see like, you know, are they gonna stay down there? Will they ever get back? But the downside was veteran. I knew that we're not gonna get any fucking fanatic players on the show, are we? Like they're not gonna come on when they're losing. We have learned this much. Like, you know. They'll go on the the, the riot one where, you know, they have to they have to hold back the fastballs a little bit there, you know, they have to be a bit kinder. So celebration time. Now that Fnatic's actually hit that magical 50% win rate, Young Buck's here. Now we can actually ask him <laughs> what was happening to why we couldn't come on the show before, essentially. So, Young Buck, come on, start us out, right? I guess for this thing, we should probably go back in time a bit, right? So, people have implied in your team that this wasn't just, like, completely out of nowhere. Like, if the game started and everything was terrible, I mean, Reckless implied on his stream, like, maybe Caps left because he saw some of the problems in the team that, you know, people like Reckless themselves didn't acknowledge. Like, can you can you just start us off on this topic? Like, how did Fnatic go from, like, world's finalists, yes, lose a very good player, but then suddenly have this massive uphill challenge? What was, what was it like from your perspective? I think all of it was uh, that we always had a strategy to play for late game and had the belief that our opponents were never good enough to... Uh, out macro us when they were 5k up at let's say 20 minutes so we always had very late game oriented drafts didn't play much for the early game and just let the enemies do whatever they wanted and then we said whatever it is that they want they cannot execute on it so eventually we will win the game with our stronger drafts and that is that one does technically work in the lcs it's just we're in lec now that's the problem right <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it worked all the way up until the world finals right yeah. and yes then, then that's right just, that's a good point <laughs> 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 and then in LDC it stopped working but that's because the game changed a lot sure and because every team is obviously better than IG alright <laughs> it was an alright joke it was an alright joke okay fair enough so what about this then does that mean that some of the things we saw you doing early on like did you actually have a set plan in mind of how you were going to turn the ship, as it were, and get back to being a good team? Were some of the things you were doing early in LC, were they just band-aid fixes? What was the concept? So we started out a split only focusing on mid to late game macro, uh, moving around the map, uh, playing around Baron. Uh, we played. We spent like an entire week just uh, focusing on the, the Baron right before the season start. But yeah, if you're 5k behind the 10 minutes, it doesn't really matter. Sure. Um, what we realized is that we're already losing games in our first clears. What was happening is that in our scrims, so this was the first hurdle. In our scrims, we could not get past five minutes if an enemy contested a boss scuttle or a top scuttle at level two. So that was step one. We would lose like six games a week, just the game being completely over at minute two. And this is just based on what, like miscommunication? Uh, uh, Miscommunication, misplaying, misusing spells, uh, a lot of small details in different players that just made us lose these fights or whenever they were contesting, they were like one person more or we used our spells on the crap so we didn't have right. spells to fight. It were very small things. So that was the first step. And basically what we did is we had a Sunday or a day off and we just played with our academy team and said, we're just going to play the first five minutes for 10 games in a row and we're going to fix this shit. And the first five games we got our ass smacked even by our own academy team, just fighting around the bot scuttle. But eventually we fixed that. And then we actually got to play a little bit of League of Legends, but then we turned out to also be really shit at just like three minutes to five minutes. Uh, we were bad at taking the first tower. We were bad at the continuation from when you take a first tower. So basically everything was just completely shit. And in the first weeks of scrims, no one was really punishing it. The teams were bad. Everyone was like very solo queue approach, so we could get... 
uh, a lot of victories and scrims from individual performances and teams were not good enough to close out games. So it was all fine and dandy. But then when the LDC hit, some of the teams were actually good enough to end the game with a 3k gold lead. It's actually very interesting because one of the big changes that happened in the last few weeks is that they're now picking uh, champions that are really good at getting early mid priority for Nemesis, whereas beforehand he was on Galio matchups where he wasn't able to get that, and that would always uh, result in a loss in a scuttle contest if you don't have that kind of priority. Uh, and it was interesting that you first said that you were like drafting, um, that you were like drafting for late game, but then. Uh, when it came to the scuttle contest, you actually cited that it was like minor things like spells and stuff like this, as opposed to like the champions that you were choosing. Uh, could you like elaborate on that then? Well, for example, a bot lane uh, level two scuttle contest is usually yeah. just purely jungle matchup. You don't really need prios, uh, but your mm -hmm. bot lane is level one, your mid lane is level one, so usually no one is really involved. So if you do red into both oh, sides scuttle on blue, if, on your blue side, yeah. there's no one really involved. But if shit goes down, you do need to involve your player. So, for mm -hmm. example, your bot lane needs to stand in the right positioning in the lane so they can move faster. Or they need to manipulate the wave in a way that the enemies have to walk all the way around. Mm -hmm. And these were like very small things that we weren't doing. So shit went down really fast, real quick. Okay. 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 What would you say about, um, like, obviously one of the big changes, aside from mid lane, was losing Soaz and having Whippo as the sole top laner. Right, it does seem as though the last few weeks you've changed the strategy of what you're doing with him, right? I mean, it seems like sometimes he's a, he's a bit less left on an island. Yeah, I, I think that recently we've been trying to put him a little bit more in the solo situation, actually, except for maybe last week. But that was just very specific to the champions that were picked because our opponents picked something like... Uh, I don't remember what they had in the first game in Schalke, but they had a really bad level one. So we said, okay, their red buff is ours no matter what. So then we played for the, the top side early on and got a flash. It was Vladimir or something. So that was really easy, but I think still he's like a, a sacrificial lamp, both in the draft and in our gameplay. And he just has to mostly play on his own. Like, for example, going into the road game, we didn't go into it with a plan, okay, we're going to camp top. It was just that we were given a decent draft and then our top laner was smashing and had a really big slow push. We had the Silas had to push because he's really, yeah. really broken. So it's yeah. just that the situation happened. It wasn't really we planned beforehand or in the draft. It just happened to be that way. The um, Fnatic one then, where it's... Not the Fnatic one. The uh, the first game of the week where I can't even remember... Schalke. The Schalke game then, where it was that also not really planned in drafts. Because obviously that was the one where Bipo is just getting a lot of advantages uh, solo. And then you're able to play really hard with that. But that also seemed like something where Schalke were kind of handing you the opportunities as opposed to it being like taken uh, as part of a big game plan. So we know that Schalke... Pretty much never plays around top lane. Yeah. And we just wanted to match that. And we knew that they had a weakness on level one in the top tri bush. They're watching it now, but they probably have rec recognized it themselves, so it's fine, <laughs> I guess. So we obviously planned to invade through the top tri bush, which we yep. did, and we got a flash. But yep. we did not play for top lane. I don't think Brox was yeah, top lane no. once, right? People say no, that. He was, the... you, you burned the flash early and he abused that when Odo uh, overstepped into range minions, but like other than that, you didn't you didn't do anything top side except for level one. Exactly. So people say that Bripo got more resources, but in reality, he was the one putting the resources into himself because he got sure. everything done on his own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. And on the angle then of obviously the big roster move was cap sleeves and then in comes Nemesis. Now, to be fair, there's obviously two angles to that. One is that a lot of people thought Caps was like the best player just in the West period, never mind just Fnatic, you know. So on the one hand, you, if you lose a player like that, you can't fully replace them. It's a bit like when Niski goes to join Cloud9. Like, you can look, you can judge him as a mid laner, but it's unfair to say, just be Jensen. Like, it's unlikely he's going to be Jensen. So in this scenario, Nemesis comes in, and even though it'd be very easy for fans to just say, well, you're not caps basically every week to the guy, he's shown actually, I think, a pretty a pretty respectable level considering how how badly the split started. And it seems as though now he's actually starting to get comfortable. What would you say? Yeah, I actually think he's a, a top three mid laner right now in Europe, even though maybe some people don't really see it the way I do. I can understand that because it, he hasn't been as consistent and had uh, some like the games on Castellan were iffy because it, we just don't know how to play around it. So he looked very poorly. I think his Galio games looked very poorly because we just didn't have a good jungle pick with it. Um, something we got away with in scrims at the time. So those games, he looks not that great, but I think he's a fantastic uh, mid laner. And I'm really happy that we chose a talent because we had the option to to take some really established names that are now playing in the LCS or sure, the LEC. I can imagine, yeah. 
And we were like, okay, we can take these guys. They'll be probably the fourth, fifth best mid laner in Europe. They'll be just fine. Or we just try to get the, a talent and hope they're even better or can at least grow into someone who can contest caps. And I think we ended up being pretty lucky because at least Nemesis is better than the mid laners that were on our list that were like, that wanted to join Fnatic. Mm hmm. At least at this point in time, actually, on that vet, uh, bring you on this veteran. So obviously we've yeah. had the discussion a million times over of those three rookies, Abidage, mm -hmm. Nemesis, Humanoid, who should have gone to what team? Did these teams pick right? Like, even though early on it was very up in the air and obviously the team results were drastically different for all the teams, by the end now, Nemesis has got to be, if not the best, the second best of those three, right? Yeah, I mean, I... I never really rated Abadage as highly as everybody else was rating him really. I mean, his team split. was just winning, right? So I think yeah, I mean, his team was that. winning, but also his function uh, within that team, he was just playing out winning matchups when he got them. And even then, he was making some pretty big mistakes against also Humanoid, for example, the Aatrox versus LeBlanc game. Uh, if you're playing LeBlanc versus Aatrox in mid lane, if you misstep basically once Aatrox, Aatrox can all in you and can win that trade really hard. And he did actually do so versus Humanoid. And it wasn't as uneven as it could have been, even though it did look pretty uneven for a while. Uh, but Nemesis, I, I would I would put him under Humanoid right now, but I actually think the way that Nemesis has played in the last two weeks with his team has been actually really consistent. But they they have given him pretty easy mid prio champs. The first week uh, that you of your comeback was uh, he was playing Zoe, so he was denying hard mid prio versus opponents, and Brox was playing Nocturne that whole time. So you could basically guarantee if you were parving properly that you always had numbers advantage on your side, and then your mid lane could never really group. So that was very Shulker esque. But this time. Uh, uh, on the Silas, you're actually making really hard plays with him. And that was actually really, really good to see because uh, the stuff that you were doing last split where Bwipo was giving up a lot and uh, Nemesis was basically making sure that enemy mid can never really be a problem for your guys, that was somewhat patch dependent. And this and this time around, you've, you've shown a play style that we would expect from a team that's looking to contest for a top team. And Nemesis is being a huge part of that and has transitioned to actually being a big part of how Fnatic can get ahead really early on. I also want to say that in the casting game, which would be an example of one where people may have been pointing to Nemesis one of the reasons why you guys can't make hard plays early on. I actually think a, a lot of uh, rookie mid laners uh, and uh, National League mid laners were coming out and saying that actually he played that game really, really well. So I don't think that the perceptive was like that much against Nemesis at that point. But I think that after the last uh, weekend, it's shown that he's actually going to be a big part of why Fnatic make this whole comeback that they're making. Okay. You have any thoughts on that, young buck? I would put Nemesis above Humanoid. Uh, I mean, of course. Then again, I'm, I'm really biased. <laughs> I, I think it will be proven right uh, pretty shortly. And I think that Nemesis has shown to us at least that he can play every kind of style, like control mages or like roam heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess Veteran just got to see that. Uh, we're drafting way more for yeah. priority or at least like champions that can contest every game. And yes. we're not just looking in uh, Zach Cassadin, for example, for sure. our mid jungle yeah. tool and uh, losing the game level one. Yeah. Which is yeah, which is why this weekend's really important. I do have to say, uh, Nemesis is at least playing on a team that understands concepts like tempo really well, which is the kind of thing that Fnatic uh, has been really strong on in the past. So I don't doubt that by the end of the split, uh, I'm going to get a lot of pushback on the humanoid thing. Um, but I, it's just I, very I unlikely his team is going to be at the top. Sure, it's so, very yeah. unlikely. That's yeah. why he's going to do that this split. Um, sure. So yeah, I think Nemesis is in very good hands though. Okay. Well, Young Buck, what about this then? Because another thing, if we've watched the split and how it's developed so far, is if you go back a couple of weeks, we had some reckless carry games. Like we've this, we haven't seen that for a few seasons, mate. So I, wow. I, I it, pretty accurate, right? I think he hard carried uh, last year in spring, and I think had a few really good games at the Worlds as well. Okay, sure. I mean, he wasn't even fucking played in summer, so. There was, there was that, yeah, you know, <laughs> sure. But I mean, when people think of the last year's Fnatic at their best, a lot of it was that reckless job wasn't to have to hard carry through bot lane. Obviously, that's part of what made Worlds work so well. So has there generally just been, have you had to go back and reformulate the whole system of how Fnatic works? Could you keep some of the things that worked from last year? Uh, I still think we have a really aggressive top laner and still uh, a bot lane that when it gets to 30 minutes in the game is even, you know, you will win the game. Sure. Because you have reckless. Um, yes. I, th I think nothing has really changed. It was just that uh, we had to rework our mid jungle synergy and know how to how to just play around uh, losing bot lanes, winning bot lanes better. Because usually caps will just run around the map and solo kill enemies. 
<laughs> and it's just not very realistic. That is useful to have someone do. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was it was useful, but and also if you look at if you look at the worlds, you will see that a lot of games we win through individual skill. Uh, for example, you look at the C9 series and just I think all our lanes like two v two and one v one kill the opponent sure. instead of actually good early game macro. Uh, so we never really had to address it because no one really challenged us in that uh, regard, or like really snowballed on us with the two k three k gold lead early on, other than IG. So it's just a. Uh, a matter of there were a lot of issues that were there last year already, macro-wise, uh, that we did not see, that I did not see. So that uh, that is what caused a lot of issues in this split. Okay. Well, if, if on on the light of that theme, it feels like this is the perfect time to talk about G2 then, because G2 is a team where people have had the same problem, right? They can't tell, are they actually winning some of these games because they know what they're doing? Like, are these the correct decisions? Do they just have way better players and incredible pop-off players who can all just make a million kills? It's it's hard to tell for the layman. So what do you think of G2 this season, Young Buck? Uh, very much like IG. They win a lot of individual skill, and I think their macro doesn't get tested a lot. Uh, having said that, I also wouldn't rule out that they actually have decent or good macro. Uh, yeah. Maybe they're just too relaxed in the games. Um, and the reason why is like I'm not seeing good macro yet, but I'm sure that a team that has perks in it will experience that the G2, the 2016 G2 just completely collapsed the worlds and then realized that, hey, we're winning every scrim on individual skill, but we still really need to focus on the macro aspect. I think a player like that will not allow that to happen again. And I think Caps, having been with Fnatic last year, very macro focused, also is not going to let it happen. So I assume that the macro is there, but maybe they're uh, having too much fun on the stage to actually... It hasn't been necessary at the moment. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you saw that collapse in the game versus SK, though, where they were literally chasing kills after they had middle inhibitor down instead of doing anything actually useful. Um, so that that was a game, though, where they were kind of intentionally not playing with macro, it seems, and everybody could see that they were kind of toying with their food and they got punished for it because enemy composition actually creates a lot of space for Jinx once she hits four items. Um, but they have been tested beforehand, also similarly by SK, oddly enough, but back when SK uh, got out of early game with a lot bigger leads than they used to, and they had shown a consistency in playing with tempo, and particularly Yankos himself always knew how to play if he had at least one winning side lane. You have had games where their bot lane has gotten behind and their mid lane hasn't gotten uh, so far ahead, and Wonder has ended up being the rock in that scenario, and they were still able to make really good swaps off because Yankos understands the circumstances in which you have to do that. Uh, and I, I've seen him being taught this kind of thing by Polly a lot. So uh, I do think they have a strong basis for macro there. I do agree it hasn't been tested that much and we haven't had to see anything like truly creative from them but i wouldn't say that they are like old vitality in terms of they are winning now because they have like one set thing that they're really good at even if it is like free winning lanes i do think that they're a smarter team than that and i think to to beat g2 and to overcome g2 is to actually understand league of legends properly i don't think you can just beat them by priv by like winning in draft versus free winning lanes for example uh, something like this. Like, you, I don't think they can be shut down like this. I think they are a smart team. Okay. Do you actually think Young Buck, I mean, excluding Fnatic here, obviously, because again, like natural bias, which other teams in the league, it, once we get to the playoffs, who actually do you think is a good matchup in a G2? Like, who could test them in this regard and make it not just about, you know, individual skill? Well, I don't think there's any team right now that I would say is uh, going to take more than two games. It's going to be two games or more off of G2. But if I had to give it to a team, it would be Vitality. But it is more because they Oof. are random. They are more random than other teams. <coughs> I think calculated teams will have more issues uh, with G2 uh, if they don't have the matching individual power in every role. Uh, I think Origin are the team that will always end up taking it off G2 because I think Origin understand the map on a really good level. They do seem to have a weird predilection for giving up tempo for Drakes that they don't necessarily need to do so in the mid to late game right now though, which is like my only really sticking point with their macro. But I think that their rotations are always really on point, even if their transitions, sometimes they get caught in them. Uh, I think that they're the team that have the smarts to take them. I'm surprised you didn't say Fnatic, by the way. Because Fnatic are scared. I told him to like exclude that. Fnatic, yeah. though, because I mean, oh, obviously, okay. he's going to say that in me. Or okay. even if he doesn't say it now, so, so. he's going to be like, eventually, by the summer, I guarantee we'll be beating them or whatever. Like, come on. We all know the way that okay. sort of thing goes. Because I would also say Fnatic as well. So, other than Fnatic, Origin. 
Wait a minute, wait a minute, veteran. You do have to answer for that. Wait a minute. I know Young Buck is here now, but your same for that could be G2 in a best of five. You're going to have yes. to outline definitely why that would be. So, definitely more so than uh, Vitality, by the way, because Vitality basically have the exact same set of map movements that they use no matter what and okay. sometimes it really destroys them because they don't understand the fundamental reasoning behind it like for example every single fanatic game they're going to rotate reckless around both side lanes until they have all towers down and then once mid towers down they will take reckless into the mid lane but not until all outer towers are down and they'll rotate around that uh but Vitality, for example, in the first game uh, this week, they sent Rise towards top when mid tower was not down yet, just because uh, top tower was down and they wanted to match mid. And uh, as a result, they could never get uh, any sort of collapse off mid. They barely got any chip damage off mid, and they could they they the game stalled out for a long time because of that. But they will always send their bot lane through mid, no matter what, even if they start losing tempo and even if they lose opportunities for that. Fnatic will not do that. Because Fnatic have a much smarter, more varied way to play the game. And that's the kind of thing where if you do that against G2, no matter how far ahead you are, G2 will abuse that because they understand the game on a much better level. I think Origin and Fnatic are the two teams that understand the game, at least on the basic level, at the level that you have to to beat G2. Because I don't subscribe to the idea that G2 are just a win lane, win game team. And if you don't subscribe to that idea, then you don't think Vitality are the team that's going to be able to beat them. Okay. Okay. Right, Young Buck, what do you think of Orhin then? Because obviously this is a team where I think a lot of people share veteran sentiment. It's just like, if you look at the pieces in the team, they look like the team that should be the contender to G2. Like, they, they could do it. They could do it. They, they have the macro. I agree that they have really good map understanding. And I know that Misty is a very good shot caller. I just, <laughs> don't, I just think there might be a lot of skill discrepancy in the lanes. Compared but to, that for example, yeah, so that doesn't exist for Vitality, though. Like their bot lane, for example. It does, but like the only yeah. way, the only reason I said they would take two games is because Vitality is so different than other games and will go crazy and make just coin flip the game, uh, like at five or ten minutes or well, every opportunity that they are given. Sure. That I think if the coin lands on the right side a few times, then they can get two games. Um, but I don't think Vitality will contest G two either. Okay. Expanding it beyond the scope of just playing G2, then what have you made of Aura in this split? Um, very similar to us. Very. Uh, did they have a strong start? Yeah, they had a weak start, didn't they? They, also they had, had a pretty bad start, start as well. They had a really yeah. bad start. Yeah. It's uh, one of those teams that has to grow into the split because they're very macro-focused and at the start of the split, usually the level of macro is very low across the board. And so then the teams will do have the, the game knowledge. The, the, the more weeks they get, the better they end up becoming. Yeah. And I think they were a team where it's not just look as like obviously you cited Miffy, but I think it's not just Miffy. I think New Duck's very smart. I think Cold is very smart. And I think the really good thing about all their personalities as well is that there's not too many clashing dominant personalities, but there are a lot of intelligent people who could give feedback in uh, VOD reviews and stuff. And, and this was a team that was always going to scale really well in the knowledge department as a result. Okay. Being as they only have to play SK, Rogue, Schalke and XL. So they actually have like a fairly weak schedule overall. Obviously there's like Schalke, even themselves have been on the drop. Like Orihan ends up second, do you think, veteran? Do you think they steal second? They're only a game behind now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they should. I, I, I think so, at least. What's Vitality's schedule? Uh, let's it's even easier than that. It's XL, Rogue, SK. Oh my and God. Twice. <laughs> So oh, Vitality is second place. Yeah, no, Vitality second, yeah. Vitality ah, second, right. Yeah. Yes, and they're also a really good stylistic matchup into Splice, by the way. They should basically always beat Splice, to be honest. Right, fair enough. Right, okay, what about this team then? So, Young Buck, I've noticed you are someone where even when the player's playing badly, if someone is like a legendary player, this is actually an aspect I like about you. If, a, if someone is like a legendary player, you always like give them their due. Like you don't just write them off. So in light of that, what do you think of this Misfits team? Because they're clearly a team that's had a lot of problems once the split really got underway. Yeah, early on they got some wins when a lot of teams were bad, but I would I would say from the outside, this looks like a team that doesn't really have a whole lot of answers. So what's your take on this team? It seems to me like they're very one-dimensional in that they need to win their bot lane very hard to progress the game and that they don't have many other tools. Um, if they don't get the bot lane tower before 10 minutes, they seem a little bit lost. And they've always had the issue for the last two years that even when they have a 2 or 3k gold lead, they still struggle to close out games and actually get barons. So I don't think anything has changed this season. Uh, they're still, they have to play through bot lane. The bot lane has to get a lead. 
or they don't know how to play the map. And even then, they struggle with uh, closing out games. Thoughts, veteran? I mean, I don't want to repeat the same speech that I no, give every single give week. Us, give us but I else, think the fact, the, fact that they, the fact that they can't close out games... Uh, Unless Soas is on an engaged champion, is like a, was really evident uh, this weekend versus XL. So basically, I fully agree with what he was saying there. I'm not necessarily sure if they need a uh, bot lane to be winning for them to pull off their wins, but I think this is just a team that is always directionless uh, unless Soas is on something he can engage on, which is basically being Jarvan. If he wasn't on Jarvan, he wasn't winning. And this time he was on Silas permanently stealing a Jarvan ult. And he actually did make the plays that would uh that ended up winning them the game. But it was it, it you could tell from a mile after XL versus Misfits gonna end up being the most fiesta game of the split. Uh so yeah, I, I mostly just agree with what Young Buck said here, to be honest. Because what's wild is if you look at their schedule at the end of this they could they could miss the playoffs for real. Like they have to play Fnatic yeah. Uh, who else? Schalke, Splice, and then they end with G2. So bear in mind at the position that they're in, like you probably need at least two of those to, to know you're going to have a chance at the playoffs. Like, this is a world they could lose three of those easy. I think the match against us, I think this this Friday, uh, the winner is going to playoffs and the loser is, uh, is a good night. See you, next, see you in summer because... Uh, the head-to-head will be one-to-one, and if you have a one-game lead, I think we have a really easy schedule compared to some of the teams. Sure. Um, SK has an easy schedule, Origin has an easy schedule, and then Misfits and uh, Spice have very tough schedules. So they're actually, uh, I think they're maybe the two teams that might not end up making it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Fnatic will definitely end up beating them. Like the only reason they ever actually took that mid tower in the situation that I was talking about is because uh, Hans went uh, decided to go side when Feberven was resetting, and then they ended up four v o on the mid tower, and that was the only way they were able to take it. I don't think Fnatic are the kind of team that ever give teams big opportunities like that. Uh, oh, I saw, by the way, veteran, you did a tweet where you basically said that you actually think Feverman's like mad underrated this split. So can you give us he give us some more on that? He destroyed the game versus XL, though. Like if he was on a if he was on a champion that could take turrets easily, that game would not have gone on as long as it did. Like he was the only person who was playing that game properly. He's finding every flank opportunity he could because he got as much pressure as he could on a winning champion, and he he basically played out the sides perfectly that game. Every op- every window that he could take, he took. It was absolutely insane. And I do hear a lot from your co-host, by the way, on Listen Loco, that Febivan was one of the problems with that team. And it really angers me every time because I, I think I think far and away their carries are not the issue. And this this whole the idea that like you, they need their bot lane to be winning also kind of comes into this whole theory that their carries might be the issue. I always think that their issue has been in their supportive elements. I think it's a support jungle issue. I don't think either of those two historically have actually had the ability to find these kinds of windows that you ended up relying on Feb of in that game too. And I think Sars has always been really, really strong on that. And that's why when he's on certain champions, they're able to win through that. And we actually had Hussein on the last episode confirming as much that uh, Sowers is the one that's been finding these windows. Febivan had to do that in the game versus XL. But he wasn't exactly on a champion where he's going to destroy four people on his own uh, doing that and actually set up the whole fight for his team or anything so it took a lot longer but he played really phenomenally well that game okay right young buck Schalke was a team who had a great start to the split they were looking really strong they've lost five games in a row now and they're, they themselves are in this b- mad battle for the playoff spot like that was probably going to be the last playoff spot so what do you make of Schalke um they seem pretty weak right now, and I think they're the the main reason is that uh, Camille got nerfed, and people figured out Abadag's champion pool and his uh, his comfort. And I think once you get him off of those champions, it's very easy to control mid jungle. And if you control mid jungle in this meta and uh, go to either bot or top lane, preferably bot lane, if you're uh, yeah. if you want to play correct League of Legends, then it's really easy to play against Shalka because you shut yeah. down upset, and then there is pretty much no threat on the map. Yeah, I think a big thing with Shulker is that um, if Memento and Ignar aren't able to group up together, then that team entirely collapses. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I fully agree with you there. And uh, the first thing that people changed against them was that Abadage wasn't getting easy mid matchups that made Memento comfortable enough to roam everywhere while ignoring mid lane. And uh, 
they I think you are very right that they can't really play through topside very well. They've they've had they had two games before that, one Jace game, one Silas game, where they had to play and the one they won was against Vitality and I can't remember who the Jace game was against when their bot lane was shut down. Um and Vit what Vitality did was that they went Kaiser Tom bot. They had really easy pressure versus Igna, and they played collapse through to mid, and Shulker couldn't do anything about this except for try to play through top lane, and they they did they just couldn't do it. They they've demonstrated time and time again that they're not good at playing through tempo on any side of the map that isn't bot. But if Mento Igna do get together, they're a pretty strong force. And this weekend, one big thing is that they they had that game where they had uh, Odo on Cannon, they had Ignor on Tom, and they had Upsell on Ezreal, and they weren't able. To to play really heavily with this memento ignore uh two man again and and they suffered for that that was a game that they almost lost in draft and they end up losing to splice which is a team that they should match up against really well because they're really good at pushing together their tempo but only in one very specific way and and teams have kind of figured out shulker now it was a really good plug and play team uh, at the start it was one of the strongest like early to mid game rosters in that regard but it was always a team that was going to get figured out I think a really big deal is that, uh, like you said, a lot of people figure out that they want to play, that they play around Memento and Ignore. So yeah. a lot of teams right now are banning Thresh because it's a champion that will win your lane and roam around the map very efficiently. So mm -hmm. that's tough one. Then you get Camille being nerfed and people don't give mm -hmm. Abedage good Lissandra matched up anymore because Lissandra yeah. just gets priority from being picked in the draft. So they yeah. would play a lot of like Lissandra with Camille or Lissandra with X, and then it was really easy to control mid jungle and then just go to bot lane. And if Igna was on, th on Thresh, it was just uh, the bot the bot breaker for them was just full with pink wards, was almost impossible to play against. And now teams are just banning Thresh, making sure that they don't pick a bad matchup into Lissandra. So the blind champions like uh, Zoe, for example, because then people are not going to pick Lissandra anymore. Yeah. And suddenly it's pretty easy to play against Shaka. Yeah, yeah. I mean, attacking Ignar's champ pool also just in isolation worked versus him in but in barbecue Oliver's last year, for sure. example. And so this is being a tried and tested thing when it comes to that guy. Like he's really, really good at this specific thing he does. But if you shut that down, you don't really worry about him on anything else. So. Okay. Right. What would you say, veteran, then on the on the angle of their mid lane, Rabbit Dargi? Like, as uh, is this just the wrong team for him to play in? I mean, when you look when you add it all together now, he doesn't look like he's had a great split. There's a lot of pressure on him because of stuff like what Youngbuck has just said and what I've been saying uh, to perform on this team because if they don't have that the rest of his team kind of collapses from it. Sure. Uh, and it's unfortunate that this is the kind of thing that can be shut down in draft. I also never viewed him as anywhere near as versatile as Humanoid. Um, I Yeah, I mean I think out of the three rookie mids he was the worst. This is not to say that he's bad. Uh, I think he's better than Special, for example, because now Special, I guess, we have to count as a rookie mid that's coming in. Sure. Uh, uh, I I wouldn't necessarily say it's the wrong team for him, but there was always a lot of pressure on this guy to have to perform really, really well. Like, uh, there are a lot more... There's a lot more in Fnatic that can kind of uh, go wrong in your lane for them to actually be able to play out the game, for example. Like, I think Boxer has been able to play really, really well with other mid laners in the past, and I don't really think that the same is true for Memento if he loses this specific element. And on this team, I uh, there isn't much room for error for him. So there's just a lot of pressure there. I don't really want to say that, like, he's bad or anything because i don't think he's bad i don't want to say it's the wrong team but th there was always too much pressure for a rookie mid laner okay what do you think on that angle actually young buck because obviously it is a, i mean in your team you have one yourself it's like on the one hand if someone's a rookie and they're a prospect they might end up being the best player in the team or it's, it's europe we have the mids we have all these amazing mids but there's on the same at the same time you don't necessarily want to put all that weight on someone's shoulders immediately when they come in the team. So it must be tough to integrate a rookie, right? It is, especially if they have to replace caps. Uh, <laughs> and you always try to comfort them and whatnot, but the pressure is going to be there. And a lot of players will struggle with that in the, the beginning of the split. And some people, like people, for example, they live for it. They they love the, the pressure. So uh, I would say 99% of the, the rookies will struggle a lot early in the split and really feel the pressure and usually play very safe. And I think that's also something that Nemesis told us, that he felt like he played very yeah. poorly on Galio the first one or two weeks because he, he, you don't want to be the rookie that loses the game for his team. That's sure. just like a really terrible spot to be in. Here's the thing, though. Like, 
the reason why I made this distinction for Abadage is that you guys did have, for example, in the EDG series, Caps Caps was not exactly monster ahead in that series, but you guys were able to play really, really strongly around Whippo and his advantages and give Caps windows to come back into the game. Like your team has been able to play with a mid who was behind before, even if that mid laner was Caps, you guys have managed to fill that void because you have really strong side lanes and a really strong understanding of the game. Whereas with Shulka, everything collapses if the mid lane if the mid lane isn't going properly. That's, that's why I kind of draw that distinction there. I'd be more comfortable as a mid laner on Fnatic and not feeling like everything is on me, even if I am replacing Caps, uh, as opposed to being on this plug and play team on Shulker, because the, their entire strategy is based around being able to play in this way of mid jungle. There's something that people said a lot in interviews last year as well. It's like, I don't care if I int because I know who my teammates are, so we're going to kill the enemy Nexus anyway. So he didn't really feel the, the pressure <laughs> yeah. to perform because, yeah, he had Caps, Broxa, mm. Reckless, and Hillisang next to him. So he felt very safe in that way. That Yeah, that comfort matters a lot. And I think it's one of the reasons. Like, I think it's also a reason why teams like TSM are able to take rookie players a lot and make them work is because you, you don't necessarily feel worried that you are going to entirely lose the game even in games where things do go wrong for you because you're on TSM and you always end up winning NA until, you know, very, very recently. And on Fnatic, it's it's kind of, I would imagine it's kind of like a similar thing. And you're kind of confirming that you do end up with that kind of thing. Okay. Right. We touched on them briefly before, Vitality, but only in the context of if they were going against G2 directly in a best of five series. Right, Youngbok, this is a team where I want to, I'm interested to see how you characterize them because you set it up a little bit there. Like you, you used the word random, talked about some of the aspects there. Are they a team you actually respect? Because I feel like a lot of the discussion about Vitality really is whether or not the something that works in best of one is actually the correct way to play League of Legends if it's not going to work in best of five. That seems like the distinction where a lot of people come down. So what's your take on them? I respect them because they're very different than I would ever want my team to be, which is very... <laughs> Very top side focused, always okay. pick red side for the top lane counter. Uh, top tier one is the first yep. objective in the game. Yep. Uh, but they are good at it, so I respect them for that. I don't agree with that strategic choice, so I would not be the right coach for that team, for example. But I respect that Vitality is a team that sticks to it, says this is our strength, this is how we're going to draft every game and play every game, and uh, you're just going to have to take it. So, uh, yeah, I, love, I have a lot of respect for how unique they are, and it can make them very difficult to play against as well. Uh, having said that, I don't think they play the perfect style of League of Legends because I always think yeah. that the, the bot lane tower should be the first one to fall. <laughs> Oofed. Okay. okay. What's the, can you I give us a reason for that? So, if you get two people ahead, an AD carry and support compared to a top laner, the two people are usually way more capable of influencing the map than the, the one other person can. Especially when a support is uh, able to freely roam around the map and put vision sure. everywhere, uses lands, buy, ping, buy a bunch of pink wards. And then, of course, you have the scaling aspect where AD carries just scale better than top laners because they have exponential growth in their items like uh, Infinity Edge. I mean, I will say that while they do seem to take top tower a lot, they do seem to take top tower with their bot lane a lot, and they do try to free their bot lane around the map in that sense. So, But I do understand what you mean, because uh, one big thing, again, that I alluded to before is that they will always end up sending their bot lane mid and just kind of trapping them there to play towards their top laner mostly uh Kabusha will end up just like booking it down bot no matter what and then uh if he gets caught it's whatever because they normally have really strong tempo at this point if they don't have really strong tempo at this point they'll do the exact same thing and it will really fall flat on its fucking face and and they will lose the game uh you've kind of identified by the way young but basically what most people on this show have said but you've added the addendum that you respect them for sticking to these kind of things even if it's kind of easy to identify all of this stuff i do want to say the other prospect that i said that would beat g2 into the vitality of origin did stop them getting these like early advantages that they play really really well with and basically shuttle fucking over them with it uh so i think that's like another point in the origin basket but even if you don't understand how good these aspects of vitality are in the first game that you come in, even though you should obviously understand it before then, you will eventually adapt to it over a series. So I think this is always yeah. something that won't work out in this series. 
Okay, yeah. Well, that, that actually, that part makes sense because obviously if they're playing so differently to everyone else, sometimes you just have to play the team first before yeah. you can even have a sense for what you're meant to do. That's the interesting thing is that, like, as you just said there, Young Buck, the bizarre thing is almost everyone who comes on the show sort of says the same thing. Like, they don't really like Vitality style. Like, they wouldn't do it themselves. But that's why I asked if you respect them because the thing for me is, like, even if I don't really understand what they think they're doing, if it keeps working, like you have to kind of tip your hat. Like no, it's, uh, for everyone who says they don't like it, they're not stopping it. There's very few teams have stopped it this, this split. Yeah, that's why I have mad respect for them. Um, I, I, I also don't know where they pull these wins from. Uh, I mean, some back doors, <laughs> I guess, some Baron Steels maybe. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it shouldn't work as efficiently as it does, but because they are so much better at playing for top than other teams are playing for bot, they get to rack up a few wins. And yeah, there's nothing but respect for that. Well, that is something I wanted to ask about because that is something that's unusual because obviously one of the roles over the last couple of years that has really gotten strong in Europe is top lane. We have a lot of really good top laners, but you look at most of the teams now, a lot of teams don't play around top lane at all. I mean, that's uh, that's to do with the meta top side more than anything and also really strongly to do with the meta bot side. Like right now, bot is basically the strongest lane in the game. And you do see a lot of top leaners, particularly before Conqueror became the state that it was. So that did get hot fixed really fast. Um, you had a lot of top laners where getting a lot of resources in London didn't really matter too much for their function in the game later on. You have a lot of these guys giving up uh, their leads, giving up waves to get a lot top bot side. Whippo, for example, in that 007 game, I think gave up like three waves on a TP bot where he didn't even get an assist. He just like Scion ulted in <laughs> all the kills, who cares? As his wave was bouncing topside, and it was just, it would have been death in any other top lane meta, but not really so much in this one. So I think it's more to do with how the game is right now uh, than anything. Okay. It's way easier to play the game when your bot lane is ahead compared to when your top laner is ahead. And a lot of times, if you have a strong top lane matchup, even if you don't put any resource into it, they're going to do pretty much the same as when they're 2-0 or 3-0, just maybe yeah. a little little bit slower. So their yeah. function in the game remains the same. Like even the carry top laner you had back then, uh, so after the Urgot nerf, which was the obvious one, you had Yorick coming in hot, but Yorick you could ignore, and then when he got Trinity forced, he like 1v3'd anyway. So it, there was never really a reason to put so much attention towards top side, and we had to just take it and didn't really care because he understood he would, he would be useful at some point anyway. Whether it was on Scion, whether it was on Yorick, whether it was on any of these things, but if Reckless was ahead and the enemy bot laner was behind, you'll win the game and vice versa. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, there is another team, Young Buck, that I'm not sure people respect. I'm not sure they think they play League of Legends the right way, but they also win games. And this is, of course, oh. Splice. <laughs> it has to be Splice, right? On the other end of the spectrum, obviously. What do you think of this team? Again, they get wins. Like, as much as people want to talk shit, if the team beats you in the game, you can't have understood that well what they were going to do, and it can't have been that obvious. I don't know how they get their wins. Uh, I ha <laughs> Agreed. I, I have to say, I haven't seen many of the games recently, so I can't really comment. I just know they're a really uh, play for late team, and we have the running meme that they won't start Baron until 37 minutes into the game. Uh, yeah. They just seem really passive. They don't pull the trigger on doing Barons or uh, playing around the map very well or just hard engaging. It's just, it just seems like they're comfortable just running around, killing minion waves and uh, running around a little bit more. They keep, yeah, they keep swapping off tempo this weekend. It was really, really strange, but they kept swapping off tempo and just basically allowing the map to fall into enemy hands. But the first time they did it was against Shulker, and Shulker did the most int baron I've ever seen in my entire life, and they collapsed on it and they won with like a much better team fighting comp. And this is basically how how they have been winning most of their games anyway. They will lose tempo, they will group in inefficient scenarios, and if enemy is misstep or misplaying, they will capitalize on it and then they will win. And they're not a top tier team like they were last year because teams have just gotten much better now and they won't give you all of these kind of windows but they always do something like this and there'll be so many games where they'll have a side lane ignored mid to late game and it will tilt me the whole time but then somehow enemy will get caught and and it will just somehow work out for them now and it's like this it's really banal, but Vitality will obviously dick you if you suddenly ignore side lane, because now probably Cabo Shard is steaming up it, or Jazuki is steaming up it. You're losing everything. They'll probably collapse on you at some point with two levels ahead everywhere, and then you'll die, and 
this is this is how Vitality will end up beating Splice. Probably this exact scenario will happen uh, in the game. So, do you think it will actually be effective in the playoffs? Oh, no Splice, yes. please. Yeah. Uh, no, because I have like a sneaking suspicion that might actually <laughs> win some games. Uh, against less experienced teams and players, maybe because Young Buck will obviously never feel this since he has won every single playoffs that he has been in since he became a coach. But a lot of people do feel a lot more pressure at playoffs than they do in a uh, regular season. He and might feel a bit of pressure this really? time, you know, this split. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe there's, there's, um, there's a ton of pressure every time, Always. there's a ton of pressure every time, yeah. but uh. But sometimes, sometimes players will feel like a bit more jumpy, a bit more uppity, and and those are the kinds of things that Splice work really well against in the mid to late game. Whereas Splice have always played the scared style you would expect people like that to default sure. to the entire time. So maybe Splice will end up having an advantage at playoffs. And I only really say that because we had like two players say that this kind of thing happens uh, when they hit playoffs anyway. Uh, but overall, I agree with you, but that that shouldn't happen. If it does happen, it's just because of the mental pressure of being at playoffs, not for any sort of strategic best of five adaptation, anything like that. Sure. Thing is, though, actually, Young Buck, on that topic, like, to get your thoughts on it, jokes aside, obviously that was just meant as like a, a witty remark, but I actually think, I know obviously you're a fan of MMA, and if anyone's ever watched the behind the scenes of MMA fights, it's actually really, really enlightening, because when you see the fighter like just on camera, and especially if they're a really dominant champion, so like GSP, Anderson Silva, the people who were like, you know, they were the gods of their division, they won like, you know, eight title fights in a row, or whatever, what happens is once those people get like three or four title defenses in, even as a fan, you start like overrating them, like you start thinking, oh, they'll never be like, I used to literally, like, I'm not joking, until Anderson Silva lost, I would have probably bet you my life he would never be able to be beaten because it just looked like that when you saw him fight. And you would also think, oh, his, me you know, his mental frame must be perfect. Like, he must never feel worried for a second. He must think but if you ever watch the behind the scenes, what you realize is even the champions who've won like a million fights, like GSP, this is probably the best example. It's probably the most dominant champion ever if you look like, like <laughs> pound for pound, like how far ahead he was of winning against the opponents. He'll even admit he was like scared going in half the fight. He just had such a great mental frame; he could perform in spite of it. Yeah. So when you guys mentioned that you felt there was, that you thought that there was no pressure on me, a lot of best of fives I went into it thinking like, "Oh, this might be the last one. You know, this might be the last one of the year, the last one of the split." <laughs> okay. Uh, every best of five, there is some kind of worry. Maybe this guy woke up with on the wrong side of the bed and is gonna run it down today yeah. because we've had we've had those days. Uh, so. Every time there was a lot of worries. I think the only time we weren't worried was when we was, was G2 against Unicorns of Love because we right. knew we already played the finals uh, yes. the week before that. Yeah. We just knew we could not lose to this team. <laughs> that was so, the one where Riot just wrecked the seeding by just changing the entire meta going in the playoffs. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. I yeah. was definitely joking just to say if, uh, sure, yeah. you thought yeah. I thought you had no... No, no, I, that's why I said it was just a joke, obviously, yeah. <laughs> I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to see what his take was on that. Okay, let me think, actually. We talked about a lot of... Oh, we haven't really talked about SK much. We briefly mentioned them before. Obviously, Ooh. they're a team that you've already played twice in the split. Three I know people tried to... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Like three times, oh, yeah. God, yes. Sure. It's nice of you to bring that up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, some people would probably leave that out. No, no, you're right, Thorin, twice I think it was, yeah. So, obviously, this is not going to be a top team. Like, if you've looked at them play, they have some parts that have been good. They've had some, actually, the amount of wins they've got, I've got to give them tip of the hat, very well done. The amount of wins they've been able to grind out. But if you look at the pieces in the team, this isn't a team I think anyone even looks at and says, oh, they should be 20% better, they can get this much. What do you, what do you make of this team, Young Buck? I think they have a really good mid jungle uh, combo, and uh, Selfmade makes a lot happen for his laners. But I think his side lanes are not the strongest in the, the LEC, so that they have weaknesses there. And Selfmade usually covers up for them quite well in the games. But if he if he wouldn't, uh, I don't think they would be a playoffs team. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. I think Selfmade has been absolutely smurfing it up on that team. I think he's uh, always found opportunities early game to do things, and I think even when his side lanes, because I definitely agree on this point, that his side lanes mess up a lot. Even in uh, early game scenarios when his uh, side lanes are messing up, you can see from his parving what his intent was with the matchups that he had, even if he's not often able to actually execute on said intent because Whirlib will suddenly burn flash and everything will be fucked up or something like this. Um, I do think 
Crown Shot has had uh, some really good games, uh, but I'm not sure that that as a 2v2 bot lane uh, has actually been uh, that consistent. Uh, and Selfmade is definitely the standout here. I I think they should be O2 this weekend, and I kind of I kind of take this weekend as like an O2 weekend because G2 really just gave that game to them, uh, and it's clear that with the setups that they have right now, that they're not going to be able to compete with any of the top tier teams, which is a real shame because they have one of the best junglers uh, in the league right now. I think I think he's a top four jungler for sure. If they had an, like, obviously it's, the, the problem here is who I would put in. If you took out self-made from this team, and let's just say for hypothetical, they just get whoever you think the most average jungler in the league is. So not bad, not great, just an average LCS level jungler. Would they be the worst team? Would they actually be worse than XL or Rogue? Or would they still be slightly a cut above? Where would you put them? They'd be a lot worse. They'd be a lot worse because Selfmade doesn't just uh, look for good opportunities early game, which is what you had with like Peak Memento and Peak Max Law years ago, or like any of these previous guys that we would call like really strong junglers. This guy has found really good windows in the mid to late game, not just on late game scaling champions like Carthus, but also on champions like Lee Sin. He's found these small specific windows and he's always executed on them with astonishing consistency in a way that you don't see except for the really top tier sticking power junglers like Yankos. Like he he he's a promising prospect on like a different level in my opinion. I think he's going to end up being one of the best junglers in Europe very soon. What do you think, Young Buck? I think they'll be around the same level as Rogue and XL because those teams also yeah. have a few really weak players. And I think SK could take games off of them still, even with a lesser jungler, but um, probably not as consistently. So in the best of five, they might go like 3-2 against Rogue and XL. Yeah. Are you particularly impressed by self mode? I am. Um, I think he does take sometimes some random risks that aren't very necessary. And for example, in our very first game where we played Swain, he ganked top lane like three times before 10 minutes where we didn't do anything on the map. But had we had any good macro understanding, the game would have ended on the spot because he failed the gank in top lane. If you are if you gank top lane after level six, you better be ready for the army to hit your bot lane tower because there's four people coming for it. But, <laughs> sure. but we, were, we were not good enough to send, to send the, the cavalry to the bot lane uh, and to realize these moments. But right. if you do that in this meta, the game usually ends. Okay. So he had this one really bad game against Vitality as well, where he saw Mowgli uh, on the ward bot side move towards his blue buff. He was on Lee Sin, he just done red. Uh, and he moved straight into his blue buff bot side, and Mowgli just instantly engages on him when he had no possible chance of following up. So he's not like absolutely perfect or anything like that. He has had some bad early decisions and stuff, but he has had a level of consistency that I haven't seen from Rookie Jung in a long time. And every jungler has had some pretty bad games. And Sure, of course. So, yeah. Yeah. So thing is, I would, I I'm would not just delusional say that. that he's like perfect or something like this. I do definitely recognize okay. he has had some bad games. Thing is, I will definitely give props in as much as like I actually do think like even though junglers use it as a cop out, like oh, you can't judge junglers because you know like the strength of the rest of the team and you know like that does usually sound like they're just trying to sidestep any criticism. But to be fair, it's really hard to look this good on a lineup that's not good. Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. fucking hard as a jungler in 2019 to look really good a lot of the time. No, it that, is. Tough. It, he wouldn't look this good if his skills didn't also translate into just a general mid to late game understanding of how to play League of Legends. There are a lot of junglers that have gotten away with just having really strong early parving, but he, he just actually understands the game really well. And there have been plenty of games where they have been behind early game because of sidling misplays or maybe sure. mid lane was leaning to the wrong side and got caught and died, which actually happened this weekend. And he will find those windows and he will bring them back into the game. That's, 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 that's a different thing from what you've seen beforehand with the jungler who, oh, well, maybe if this guy was on a really strong team, he could prove himself. He's not Basically going to Basically Memento, right? Basically yeah. Memento is the example yeah, but, because obviously you couldn't know if he could yeah. do more because he thought oh, yeah. his team's fucking it up from yes. there. Yes, yes. Whereas with with Selfmade, you don't have that kind of question. Like when Selfmade joins like a a really good team, he's not going to be proving himself on that team. Like he's already done that, which is really really rare for a rookie, especially on a rookie on a bad team. So to say. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on this, Young Buck? Nothing uh, to add. Okay. What about if we tie it into the memento angle then? Because that's something else that I have to say is a bit underwhelming about watching Schalke this year. Is like when I did watch Memento play on Rocket, 
you would see all these positives. And then, like I said, unfortunately, at that point, it was hard to gauge it because they weren't going to win the game. So it's like, right, once he gets out of this nice early game he's given, I can't really know if he doesn't know what he's doing or if the team fucks it up. Or, you know, I, So you, you you want to say what Veteran just said, like, right, put this guy on another team. He'd be so good. And it's like, well, he is on a better team now. He's got some good teammates, but that problem clearly exists with him as well. Like he's, he's having issues later on in the game. That can be synergy issues, of course. And sure. I think Abadaga is on the bottom five of the mid laners. It's, I think that's fair to say. So oh, yeah, that's unreasonable. Yeah. yeah I think if, you, if you cannot control the river, like your pixel bushes on either side of the river because your mid lane is maybe getting pushed in or well, yeah, just that actually is getting pushed in or just losing his lane, it's, it's very tough to play the game as a jungler. And if you don't have the right jungle mid duo to actually just for, brute force the 2v2, then uh, yeah, it's actually pretty <coughs> difficult to play the game. So. It's hard to tell if it's Memento who is uh, at fault or Abadage. I, w- I would lean a little bit towards Abadage there. Uh, but I wouldn't write Memento off as a bad jungler. I think also, sure. in terms of the fact that he works really well with Ignar, but not maybe necessarily with Odo, that might not just be the fact that Ignar's real strength is also in the uh, early to mid transition phase. That might also be that maybe Oda Wamne and him just don't synergize very well because the one time I've worked with Oda Wamne obviously Yankos was there and Yankos is incredibly vocal about how to play these particular aspects but I don't know how the memento Oda Wamne thing kind of like uh, meshes together in that in that sense so this this might not just be purely on him I think he is still an exceptionally strong jungler I'd still put him in top five of jungle yes I think I think I'll put him on top five of jungle uh, for this split so far but uh th- there's there's clearly flaws once it gets really late in the game like that kind of balance call should never ever happen and you do put a lot of that on at least on teams i've been on a lot of that has been put on jungle was that a team that had the did the baron call with the chogas feast on silas yes i don't yes. think it was that bad of a baron call considering they, really? had two they mountain, did not they had two mountain drakes and they had chogas feast but they I had think, uh, not a 50-50. Ups- Okay, but upset was around red buff area. They weren't doing it like as a straight five man. They did not have hard mid prior mid. They couldn't have hard mid prior mid because they uh, actually didn't have tier one down mid lane, and they didn't have hard prior top. So it was a really easy time for uh, for Splice to collapse. And Splice's team fucks on collapse. That was the Galio, Vise, Tristana, all this shit team. That's fair. I'm not going to say it was a clean Baron. I just yeah. also think it was not a 50-50. It should have been like an 80-20 at worst because oh, of the no. two Mountain Drakes and the, the, the Choga Feast. The Choga Feast, he actually failed really yeah. hard. He did it on like 2k and it was on like 700 HP and Jovan should never be able to steal that. <laughs> but even if, even if, I do want to say even if Jarvan doesn't steal that, I do think that they get aced. Maybe Upset gets away. Maybe Upset gets away with uh, with the buff, but they do, they lose a lot of people for that. That's that's fair. Okay. What about actually, since we touched on tangentially there, Otto Amne, because I actually want to get your take on this as well, veteran, because obviously you did coach the guy for a while, worked with him when he was in H2K. Like this is someone where I don't feel like people ever say he's bad, even when he's had like his his down moments. But at the same time, he's now been in a lot of different teams that haven't really been able seemingly to know how to use him. And I know actually from my own conversations with him, he's someone where over the last couple of years, he himself will admit he's kind of lost his identity. Like he used to be the guy who even behind the scenes would tell you like, no, no, I love being this low econ top. And yeah, give all the good picks and all the all the resources to the rest of the map. Even privately, he'd say this shit. I would say like, why are you saying this to me privately? Like say that shit on camera. Yeah, it sounds great for coaches. Like no, privately, you're supposed to tell me you want to fucking carry that. What are you doing? You're yeah. So then he switched over and then when he was on the Spice team, he was telling me like, oh, maybe actually I should be more of a carry player. And I was saying like, well, this is fucking rich because your team never does that. What are you t- why are you telling me that now? It's like, why are you always telling me the opposite, whatever your team does? So what what is the situation? Come on, veteran, give me some insight here. I mean, mm, okay, so I want to say first and foremost, uh, on Splice, Splice only started winning when they put Oda Wamne on carries and started playing really, really hard around him. When they tried to just ignore Oda Wamne, they lost every fucking game. And then when they switched, and he was now on Camille, he was on Aatrox, old Aatrox, and actually new Aatrox as well. When he was on all of this stuff, and they played really hard to him and ignored everything else, then they were winning games. I also think his best performances on H2K came at Worlds, when he was on Kennen, when he was on Jace. Um, Smeb actually got 
uh, really drunk at the after party and said that oh the one there was like the best top laner there and all this stuff and they actually are on that's how in. drunk he was right okay and <laughs> no their coaches <laughs> sure, soberly, okay. their coaches soberly in interviews said that uh oh the one they was destroying everybody in scrims at that point i can confirm he was destroying everyone in scrims at that point Fair um enough. i actually think he has always shined really well on carry champions and he has been on teams that can play really well around top lane being uh the carry so i wouldn't want to denigrate Oda one they too hard on the base of this split. That being said, the game he played against you was really monster int. Even if you did burn his flash early, he made some pretty poor decisions in lane that should never be made. Um, but in spite of that, I think overall he has actually had a really, really strong split. Even if the great shame of Schalke is that they're not really able to play really well around any other lane but bot, and by that meaning not play really well with anyone but Ignar to facilitate everyone else. So I think he, he is definitely a victim there, and I still think he is an incredibly strong top laner, and I think he should be trusted more on carries than anything. What do you think, Young Buck? I think Odoham has had a really good split. I think last year was not uh, a great split for a great year for him until he was playing the Camille, like you said. Yeah. And it instantly made me think of uh, Fishy Judge and Spice right now because he's playing Cho'Gath and Scion and Urgold only. Uh, <laughs> when we looked up his match history, we were like, wait, are these guys playing a diff on a different patch enough? Yeah. Because Fishy Judge is, <laughs> is, has like. Maybe is he letting someone else play on his account? <laughs> yeah, because this is not uh, the Fishy Judge we know. But maybe that. Uh, it's a splice thing where they don't allow their top laners to play carry champions and focus purely on tanks. This happened uh, on Schalke last year as well. He was on okay. tanks purely in the second half of summer. Ah, uh, yeah, Fishy Chachi Poppy. Yes, I remember. yes, yeah. yes. Um, but yeah, I think Oliver has had a really good split. And I always respect players that don't really require a lot of attention from their junglers, uh, top mm -hmm. laners. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think he's someone you always have to scout and be aware of what he's playing. And... He's just, he's just a good player overall. Probably definitely top five. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I also want to say that when he was playing like low econ tanks top and stuff, we did have Forgiven in the bot lane. Uh, so this was definitely uh, a team that you, you would be more than happy to play these kind of low econ things top. And really early on, we all kind of knew that this was the plan and that this is how he wanted to play. Another one, they was fully down for that. Sure. Uh, at Worlds, the meta was kind of changing, and we ended up just playing straight out with three winning lanes for as long as we could possibly do that, uh, which was all the way to top four. So, yeah. Sure. Well, no, I definitely understand that if you have forgiven in the bot lane and you're a top laner. I mean, Young Buck can tell you this. You go with the stream, not against it. With the stream. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. Young Buck believes bot towers should go first, so he is all okay. on forgiven side. So. Right. Yep. And only took him a few years to get to the same agreement. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was with. He was on the team with Forgiven. Yeah. 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 yeah but the difference is that wasn't that wasn't necessarily one of his laws back then. We didn't always have the greatest times, so or always saw eye to eye. But uh, I still have a lot of respect for him, and I love that the enemy bot lane tower always fell before ten minutes. So there's that. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's what you call a pressure reliever. Yeah. <laughs> right. What about this then? Actually, since we just brought him up tangentially, I've, I mentioned this on this in local, but Forgiven told me that he is going to basically come back. That's what he claims, right? But he did say to make it kind of like tease it more. Because obviously everyone worries, right? Well, if he comes back, but he joins Rogue, then who really gives a fuck? Like, you know, yeah, they might win some more <laughs> games, but they're not, you know, they're not going to be like that good. And also it doesn't really do that much for his legacy, you know, to just play on Rogue and be okay in the LEC. So the key thing is, obviously people want to see him come back to a team that has some pieces that can do something. Now he implied like, yeah, he'll come back, but it either has to be a good team or, and then I'll, I'll find a way to phrase this that's polite, or he's just going to go and get paid in Turkey. Like, that's the only, that's the only, like, kind <laughs> way, there's the only kind way I can find to say it. Like, it's either going to be a team that's got some good pieces or money. Like, those are the two. Which, by the way, fair enough if you're forgiven. Like, you must have been over your whole career pretty underpaid. So, like, if you just want to go and have that one year where you get the bag in Turkey, go for it, homie. But what do you think, Young Buck, if he was to come back? Like, first of all, do you think, t do you get the sense within Europe, would teams actually want forgiven a couple of years out from being a, a fully active pro? Do you think people would get, take a risk on him? I think a team or two might take a risk on him. Uh, looking at Rogue and Excel. But then again, will forgive and join them. I think it's more in, for forgiven is his pride. He doesn't want yes. to go to a team that might end up fifth and sixth where he looks like an idiot. Um, 
So for him, it's either go all the way, make a run at Worlds, or just go for the money and finish on 10th and not uh, and just know from the start that there's low expectations. But having said that, yeah, I think there will be a few teams that might be interested in taking the risk, even if it's just as a substitute, because Forgiven is uh, extremely talented. Let's be real. So Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure Forgiven would ever join the team as a substitute, though. Uh, just... Well, the trick would be you wouldn't tell him he's the substitute. You'd say, listen, you're go we're going to have a sub rotation, but you know the other guy's the sub. And then what you do is, once he's already signed the contract, about five games in, you go, actually, yeah, we'll put the other guy in. He's like, what? It's like, too late now. You signed the contract. There's a little <laughs> tip for everyone out there. Don't t Obviously, if you're a team out there, please don't tell him straight up that he's the sub. That's the end of the negotiation process. Just lie, but maybe even lie to yourself. Nah, if it works out really well, of course, he wouldn't be the sub. And then if it has to happen, it happens, okay? Just now that you've said this, Warren, he's going to demand on his contract that, of if, course, said yeah. that if there's ever a sub ADC, he is his contract is void. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like this, like of he's he he. If you break Forgiven's trust once, he he holds it against you for the rest of his life. I can tell you that much for sure. Indeed. Right. What's your take think, on it, then, veteran? I don't think he would ever join Excel. He has a lot of friends on Rogue but he would demand changes for sure, because there are definitely elements on Rogue that he would refuse to work with. Uh, but there are a lot of elements on Rogue that he would love to work with, so uh, sure. he would probably demand some changes. Uh, I, f I think that most teams in the LEC should take a chance on Forgiven, because I think Forgiven's a rare talent, uh, where I would actually be confident about him coming back from any sort of kind of break and to start to perform again to the level of whatever opponents that he is up against. Uh, and there aren't too many players that I would say that about. Febervin is actually <coughs> obviously one of them. Uh, Caps is going to be another one now. Um, but these kinds of talents are rare, and I think Forgiven is one that if anybody's looking to upgrade their bot lane, they should absolutely look out for. That being said, the AD carry pool in the region is way stronger than it has ever been before when Forgiven was actually here. Back then, his only real competition was Reckless, and he kind of pissed all over him every time they met up. Uh, now you have hands here, you have upset here. Sheriff is looking really good. You have a pretty decent pool that he That's would. That's pretty have. solid, right there. Yeah. Yeah, you have a pretty decent pool outside yeah. of just reckless, and reckless is a lot better than he was uh, back when uh, back when he was facing Forgiven. So I'd actually be really interested to see how he performs against everyone. But I have every confidence in Forgiven. That sure. being said, I basically just named five teams that wouldn't be looking to take him or don't sure. have the need to take him especially if they're going to be competing with apparently turkey money so just saying could be out there because the thing with that topic is i've noticed there's a massive disconnect between people who are actually in the european scene like players coaches people who followed it for a long time and everyone else because everyone else so i'm talking mainly about people on reddit and americans etc they all live in some fantasy world where they're like why would any team try for giving out he hasn't even played for like two years and it's like First of all, this is not a normal player we're talking about. It's not just random AD cap. I'm not just saying bring back like fucking Vardags or something. I'm just talking about some random player from three years ago. I'm talking about someone who's literally known. I mean, remember, the, 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 the best advertisement for Forgiven is he's done it already twice in his career. He keeps going, taking a split off, leaving a team. And then when he comes back, he almost never misses a beat. Like he's had like, what, one bad split in his bloody career. So I'd, that's the difference between having clout with people who know and the general public. And sometimes you do get that big disconnect, I think. If you're I, 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 I got the sense a lot of people actually would be interested in him. If you're talking about the Gambit split, they would have made a uh, play. They would have, yeah. 100%. Yeah, but he got banned. Yeah. He didn't say certain things in Surly Q that should never be said. Yes. <laughs> Uh, which may also be a, an unattractive thing about him to some people if you can't even rely on that. Sure. But it's all in the past now. But I, so in my estimation, I don't actually think he's ever had like a bad split as a player. That could be his worst split, sure. But even then, I thought he was on track to, to do it all again. Sure. Do you have a last topic? Uh, not really. I was actually kind of interested in asking a very specific aspect of your lane swap, but that would probably end up being kind of boring. In the lane swap? Uh, yes, because like you leave year, Reckless. Or? Yes, this year, because you leave Reckless bot uh, solo, and you send uh, for a four-man top side. But you always send Reckless bot sides uh, on the, on all of your swaps, whereas normally everybody would just send their full bot lane top side, and then shove out, and then send their top lane or uh, bottom. But you always send Reckless bot while you send Hellasang top side, and you've done that both games this weekend. 
is this like a is this a specific situational thing or like this is the kind of thing that I'm not entirely sure if you'll want no, I think to be comfortable situational. answering here. Is this specific? I, I think Hilly Sang follows if the enemy swap yep. if the enemy team swaps, then Hilly Sang will follow to top lane and cover with Beepo. And then we get solo XP and platings on the AD carry. And mm -hmm. so if we're behind in tempo, Reckless will push in the wave and if the enemy yep. top lane and shows on bot lane, he will recall and, and join. Mm -hmm. But if we get the bot lane tower or intend to swap, we have the intention to move Reckless with the team to top lane. Yes. But uh, so is this uh, something that you will ever do outside of scenarios where you, because every time you've done this now, it's basically being when you have killed enemy bot lane, but you don't take tower and you go for the tempo reset and then you go for the herald at the same time as Reckless gets solo XP and plating spot. Would you ever do it in a scenario where you don't just uh, dive bot lane and kill them and get a huge tempo lead in that? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think he okay. only moves to top lane or like moves towards mid if he yep. thinks the enemy might swap. Okay. And then if they do, he will cover for people. That's it. Uh, there was no. I don't think there was even intention to do Herald. I don't fully remember. Herald was started the first time that uh, that this happened. Was the Shulker game? Herald was already started at this point. Right. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. I can I can elaborate. We knew that they were swapping very likely because they were not having a good time in bot lane. Yeah. But Bipo was very certain that we were going to get the Rift Herald because he had priority and was much stronger than Vladimir. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was more. It yeah. was actually a bad judgment call because okay. yeah, the cavalry arrived. Both times this happened, by the way, uh, they just replayed your dive, and then the game would come back, and like Herald was just about to finish, and Reckless was boss. And this is why I was actually interested in asking you about this. I never actually got to see uh, what happened after the dive. Anyway, yeah, it was just messy. Not, it was not set up to uh, swap like this and do a Herald. This video and all of the content on my channel is kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Gardner Wilson, James Harding, Ollie J, Tobias Bernasconi, Nate DOGG, Travis Greb, Tristan Jones, and as always, a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to take part in an esports discussion with yours truly? Would you like teasers for some of my upcoming content? See who the guests are going to be. Do you want to ask me a question for my monthly video AMA? Perhaps you'd like to suggest a guest you'd like to see my content or a topic to discuss. Well, if so, then put your money where your mouth is and join the Screluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.